I'm Terrence Glover, and the highest and best use for my business is customer service and urban planning. Thanks for tuning into the highest and best use real estate podcast, where we talk about techniques to optimize your land, structure, skill sets, and time, as well as the highest and best use principles to make your business more profitable, productive, and efficient. I'm your host, Ryan Carr, reminding you that good deals are found, great deals are created. And today, we have Terrence Glover on the show of Urban and Mind Planning Consultants. Uh, Terrence is a super guy. He's been a pro planner for 27 years. He's out in Burlington, and I've actually used it myself on a handful of projects. So, uh, Terrence, happy to have you on. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Uh, so there's a few key points that I want to talk about on this episode. We'll, we'll say three. Um, number one, I want to define what the highest and best use um, is for, for various projects as a land planner. Okay. Number two, I want to hear about examples of past projects, projects that you've done to get your clients highest and best use of, of their properties. And then number three, I want to touch on the, on the, on the technical side of land planning. Like what is an MZO? Um, let's talk about title. What is the plan of subdivision? How does the LPAT fall into some of these circumstances? Um, th that's kind of where I want to take the show. And uh, I hope the listeners get great value from that. So is that cool? Sounds good. Yep. Awesome. All right. So why don't we just kick it off? Introduce yourself for the listeners who may not know about you. Uh, so my name is Terrence Glover. I'm the principal and founder of Urban and Mind Planning Consultants. That's urbanandmind.ca. And uh, we do we do land planning, land development, land investigation, and septed review. I'll explain all that in a bit. Uh, for anywhere in Ontario, essentially, we have clients from Windsor to Ottawa, Niagara, uh, up north Muskoka. Um, we have one uh, northern Ontario, but it's very I mean development's limited up there. Plus, it's uh, unorganized territories instead of municipalities, so it's a little bit different. Uh, but generally, we concentrate GTA uh, area, um, Durham. Hamilton, Niagara, because that's the, we're located in Burlington, obviously. Um, we've been doing land planning here for about seven years now. I opened this business uh, 2015. Uh, we started with me in my basement, obviously, and uh, grew from there. Now we have uh, four employees plus myself, so it's five uh, planners, planning technicians, uh, myself. We've done projects for municipalities, for the province, uh, for developers, obviously. We concentrate on small medium-sized developers and mom and pops which is i believe your audience uh, we i just to give you some background on myself as well i was a a uh, started as a planning technician planner senior planner manager director of planning then director of planning and building um and i got disenchanted with the system the, the government system in terms of of putting people through red tape for no reason and Consultants just overbilling because they could, because the clients didn't know any better, especially the small, medium-sized clients. Um, and we started this as a customer-focused uh, business. So I left my job as a director and started this business. And and we are really providing that extra level of service uh, that larger firms don't, or or even in the larger firms, uh, they delegate uh, small and medium-sized developers to junior staff where. Uh, I'm the principal, and even if my staff are assisting you, I'm looking at everything before it goes in and out of the of the office. And I'm also in communication, and the clients can call me specifically as well. So we focus on that customer care uh, system, and we do everything from from investigating property before you buy it. Uh, and I always make a joke here that that people often investigate their used car to get it certified and everything before they buy it, but they don't do the same with the land that they're yeah. going to buy. It costs you know a thousand times more. Um, so we do that investigation first. We do, there's different levels. There's a stage one light, a stage one full. And a stage one light uh, is something that we do very quickly for us and the and the client as to if they want to develop it. If the client's looking to flip the property, um, then we do stage one full and that's about a 70 page report. And it's basically, it's a marketing tool. This is what you have, this is what you can do um, to, to, to sell the property. Hmm, that's um, that's that, awesome. Yeah, and that increases the, the uh, you know it increases the, the betterment of the property as well as the value of the property by providing that information which they have to do themselves anyways typically yeah that's so important i mean going into a deal i think that's one of the biggest things that not enough people spend enough time on is is front ending the work like you can buy a piece of property and just hope for the best and it's a farm and you can never build on it right or you can actually front end the work do a stage one light do a stage one do a pre-con with the town like do something to say hey yes this, these are my this is my opportunity. Like, have you been in that situation before where people have bought something just gone gunslinging and, and you realize like, hey, this is a dog. We, we get them all the time because we, again, <laughs> we deal with unsophisticated developers sometimes, mom and pops and, and that. 
uh, when they buy property, they on the surface it looks good, but but they don't always. Um, I, I'll give an example to you. Um, we had a client in uh, in Mount Hope in Hamilton area. This is a number of years ago uh, mm -hmm. near the airport, and they wanted to put a lumber yard on a piece of property. And the the city said, yeah, you can put a lumber yard. The real estate said, yeah, you can put a lumber yard. Um, the politicians said, yeah, you can put a lumber yard. Uh, you had to go through a zoning uh, a bylaw amendment. Oh, was you? Yeah, zoning bylaw amendment. And they said, yeah, we will support that. Uh, you'd have to go through a site plan approval, which is typical for a commercial use. And and they said, yeah, you do that. What they no one told him though was that it, to go through the site plan approval, a condition of that approval would be that you had to connect to municipal services, which is water, wastewater, stormwater. And uh, unfortunately, the, the municipal services were about a mile down the road. So he, I was going to so, say, where are the sewers? Oh, God. <laughs> so he could have done all that, but he had to extend the sewers by a mile, which oh. threw the budget out the window. So I saved his butt there. Uh, he backed out of the deal before it closed. And, and oftentimes I tell our clients to say, put a conditional offer in so you lock the property up, uh, but have a condition similar to a home inspection, a planning review or a planning inspection done. Mm -hmm. um, and if it comes back unsatisfactory, you can back out of the deal. But at least you lock that property up for the meantime. And then we do that, that review or test for you to see if there's any oddities or, or, or negative impacts uh, to development that would, you know, hurt your, hurt your business plan. Yeah. Okay. So then as a planner, when you go into a situation like that, or even a, even a, like a positively optimistic scenario where you think, you know, this is what we can do with the property. How do you guys define highest and best use from your perspective? To go back to your point a little bit earlier about people need to spend more time on the preparation of the development as opposed to the actual processing. So in my opinion, the importance of, of the research and review of a property is 70% of the importance of a project and 30% is processing that, going through the applications and, and that. However, only about 5% of the time is taken doing that research, where 95% of the time is actually going through the process. So although the process is not as important because it's really just going through the system, the, the importance is to know what you're buying and getting into ahead of time. So you can you can preempt a lot of issues that are going to come at you. Uh, it could be natural heritage, could be could be um, uh, historical, it could be it could be new roads coming through the area, it could be stormwater, it could be anything. A lot of those issues that will have to be dealt with in the process can be identified and isolated or even removed during the research and, and review process. Um, so, so your question was, how do we go through and find out the highest and best use? Um, it's not as simple as, a, as like a one word or one sentence answer, but sure, sure. But essentially, we look at a property to see if there's development value that has not been realized yet. So, someone comes to us with a with a a large lot that has a single house on it that is basically it's an underutilized lot or and we look at infill development or they give us a big piece of property you know we could 40 acres 80 acres 100 acres whatever and they say what can i do with this um we look into the policies from provincial regional uh local conservation agri escarpment whatever the case may be and we say we say this is what you can do today but this is your unrealized value or unrealized development potential uh, that's not obvious to most people. And if you go through this process, this process, this process, these are the issues you're going to have. But at the end of the day, this is what you can get out of it. Um, mm. And that's where that's where we look at the potential. And that's essentially what a stage one report is. Uh, stage one light or stage one full is we look at all that. We go through it and, and figure out where is the potential here. Once that report's done, you can then take that and, and say, I like the business plan of it. Let's move forward. And the stage two would be what we call it. And we break it in. Basically, it's the same process for all planning consultants, but we break mm -hmm. it into pieces because we have smaller clients and value and, and, and cost and everything is more important to the small guy than it is the big guy. Yeah. Do you find that on the smaller on the smaller deals? Like, let's just say you're doing infill. You're doing like an infill lot, residential, uh, take a house down, split the lot, build two kind of thing. Do you find that the wiggle room between doing something small versus some type of large uh, multifamily building, apartment, condo, um, you know, subdivision. Do you find the margins there are tighter, thereby the clients have a little bit higher of an expectation to make sure that the numbers line up? Or how do you see that falling on the budget side? Yeah, uh, when you're talking scale, uh, smaller scale development, uh, the price points are tighter, obviously, because you're, you're talking about one new house as opposed to 40 new houses. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when you have 40 houses, you can, you can fix that margin in terms of the price points and everything. Uh, but one new house, you have to be kind of bang on. Now, when, in any development, there's going to be surprises. There's going to be political opinions. There's going to be 
um, uh, neighborhood feedback. There's things that you can't predict, but you can you can anticipate, but you can't predict. Um, some things are, are major, like if you're if you're doing a development and you find a skeleton buried in your property, for argument's sake, <laughs> you know you got You have a whole uh, um, uh, heritage, uh, archaeological. I mean, you, you're set back for, and those are things you can't anticipate. Yeah. Um, Ever done uh, that? You ever find a dinosaur or something like that? You're digging up, and you're like, oh man. No, there was there was a body that they found in uh, St. Catharines when I was uh, working down there. Really? And, uh, it was just it was a. Uh, it found to be, uh, you know, three, 400 years old, but still there's a whole process and the whole development was delayed for about two years. Um, hmm. So, but that it's very unusual that you would find that because most graves are marked, um, but they, but they have to check, make sure that there was no murder and like that. They have to go through the whole system yeah. uh, and they have to look to make sure there's no other burials or artifacts around that. So it could really uh, upset the site development process. But again, that's, that is like one in a thousand. It, it, it doesn't <laughs> say that often. Um, yeah. Uh, sorry, I think I, I think you have any questions there on that. Yeah, no, that, that was great. It, it, it's interesting because those are the things that people don't often hear about. Oh, we found this thing buried underground. Maybe it was a person. Maybe it was a dinosaur. Maybe it was a, an oil tank or something, right? But like that stuff can really derail a project. Can you imagine carrying a, a full-scale commercial development because they found an artifact underground that was close to a riverbed or something like that. And then and they say, oh, we have to, we have to go full historic rescue on this thing. Like that's huge. Yeah. Normally um, most developments in Ontario now, uh, they kind of change the policy. The provincial level changed the policies uh, a few years back and municipalities have bought into it. So just as a vetting exercise, they make most developments do an archeological report, whether it's a phase one or phase two or three or four. Um, essentially the phase one is a, is a desktop exercise. What was here before? Um, are there potential to have artifacts or something at this location? Most municipalities have a map of where archaeological potential is. If you're within that area, you typically have to go through a stage two, which is mm -hmm. which is they're going to do some test digging to see if anything pops up, such as pottery or or anything like that, um, or, or or God forbid, a skeleton or something. Right? Uh, <laughs> stage stage three is where they they have identified some hot spots, we'll call it, and they want to do a more thorough dig of that area. Um, and stage four is like, you know, you have major issues, um, mm -hmm. but typically the stage one and two are part of any planning process nowadays. Uh, so they'll vet the property for you to make sure that these surprises don't typically happen. Not that they won't happen, but the occurrence of them are, are really less likely. Gotcha. Okay. So on that, um, you're saying stage one, stage two, and so on, is that different than an environmental phase one, phase two, and, and how do they differ? Yeah, so uh, environmental looks at site contamination through chemicals and things of that nature. So um, a phase one uh, is called envir in the environmental is, again, a desktop exercise. What mm -hmm. what has occurred here? Is there any uses that would have potentially polluted the property? Uh, uh, phase two is they're actually going to do some dig, dig some holes, do some testing of the soil for the chemical um, properties in the soil. Um, and phase three is, is uh, you got some some contamination we need to figure out how to re remediate it and if it's simple it could be uh, just an air uh, aeration of the of the uh, like for oils and that aeration and gasoline to to vaporize the contaminants or it could be theoretically uh, pcbs uh, radioactive material who knows what it is and that has to be properly processed and cared for uh under phase four so um under the under the archaeological they look similar type of exercise but looking for different things under uh, um, the environmental, they're looking for chemical components and that, anything that would potentially harm people or, or occupants of the site. Um, and then ours, not the different is stage one, stage two, stage three, ours is uh, mm -hmm. look at the property, do some concept designs for it, site plans, et cetera, and then stage three, go through the process. And, uh, you know, God forget, stage four is to be appealed and go through the, uh, the legal system <laughs> after the fact. Okay, I want to talk about the LPAT and the previous OMB and all that stuff um, closer to the end. So I want to put that one on hold because I'm, I'm definitely curious there. Um, there's some history there that I want to talk about. And, and anyways, we'll put that one on hold because it's, it's, it's interesting for sure. And again, a lot of people don't know. That's where the stuff can end up. You get a development deal with some bad neighbors that head south. That's where they go. Yeah. So, and, and uh, just to, not to toot my own horn up, but on our website, which is uh, www.urbanandmind.ca, mm -hmm. under there's a shop uh, logo. Uh, we have seminars, we have educational books, um, we have uh, uh, AutoCAD drawings and, and, and pictures to use and documents to explain things. Mm -hmm. But I think for most of your, your viewers, the seminar that we have, we currently have one seminar on there, which is the a primer on planning. 
Um, and it really takes you from a, 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 a novice person to understand all the different processes you have to go through and consider and think about um, when you're developing a property so that not that you're going to your 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 viewers are going to do it themselves per se because you, you want to hire a professional but it allows them to understand the process so that they don't get taken advantage of or, or brought down the path um, they kind of know what to expect in the process and uh, that seminar that i offer online is uh is uh you know explains that to to novice one that pops in that neat so if somebody did want to start an, an diy like the first deal the first development deal that i did i actually did that I put in the time, I put in the hours, I read the books, I did the things, right? And it was successful. I had a bunch of bumps in the road. So I ended up going through, uh, I bought the house, looked kind of around the neighborhood of the character and said, okay, um, this is what I think we can do just based on what the neighborhood looks like, right? And I wasn't overly sophisticated at the time, but that's actually how I found you because the town said, okay, this is what's happening. Interim control bylaw came through. I had to get a planning justification report. I didn't know what the heck that was. So I get on Google, right? I just planning justification report, Ontario, <laughs> what comes up and you popped up and that's, that's how we got connected. Right. And I DIY the first one, it was successful, but there's lots of people that do and they are not right. So, um, as a professional planner, how do you mitigate that? Um, well, we have clients, uh, again, you, you contacted us, we were introduced to each other early on. Uh, I think, I think I was starting my business. You were starting yours. Uh, we complimented each other that way and, uh, we were able to get through. And again, you were successful in that project, but, uh, some of our clients, unfortunately, they, they buy properties similar to what you did. They buy mm -hmm. properties, but they have the opposite effect that they buy properties with big issues that cannot be overcome. Uh, mm -hmm. we have a we have a client right now who's bought the property and came to us and said, I want to develop this property now that I, I own it. Um, they the theoretically they could put 86 units on a, on a property. Um, but they're stifled because there was a a it was an OMB, so back in the day it was called Terra Municipal Board, an OMB decision that set out a a criteria for development in the area that they bought within. And because of that OMB decision, they are sterile they cannot develop that property until until secondary access is provided unfortunately it's surrounded by environmental lands and, and uh, mto corridor and a rail corridor and they they it's very difficult to get a secondary access so in theory unless some magical way of secondary access occurs they're, they're not gonna be able to develop that land at all and they bought acreage you know so um Sometimes it's positive. We can figure out a solution to get around things, to get out of a, a predicament. And sometimes um, people just have to eat it and, and hopefully resell it to someone else who's not paying attention, I guess. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about let's talk about a few of your clients' success stories and maybe some of the horror stories as well. You've alluded to a few of them already, which is which is cool. Let's drive down that path. So let's let's take um, maybe two or three fresh stories of past clients that you've had where you've where you've gone through and you were successful with their planning application and they were able to do something bigger than what the initial zoning or the initial idea was when they bought the property. Sure. So I'll start off in the basic level. So we had a client uh, a number of years ago in the Vaughn area. Um, his property was listed for like three years uh, over and over again, and no one was buying it. And um, he couldn't figure out why, because he had potential on the property. Uh, so he asked us to do the stage one light, full, full, or sorry, stage one full report on it. Um, and we identified, there was a few different issues with the property, but we identified them and explained how we can overcome them or what the process was. And, once we prepared that report and he used it in his marketing material, he sold the property within three months. Um, and the, the problem there was the potential buyers didn't understand what they were getting into. They knew there was issues, but didn't understand how to get out of them or how to deal with them. My report clarified that and then it was able to sell it very quickly. So that that was increasing the, the value of the property for the for that owner yeah. uh, simply by doing a report. And that was just that was just paper, like no planning application, no, no minor variance, no nothing. Just just a little bit of knowledge on the front end. Explaining the site and and what being up front and being and I don't I don't ever hide anything. So even if we see something negative, we're gonna say it, but we're gonna say it's negative, but maybe there's this is a way to get around it or, or a different way to approach it. Mm -hmm. um, but just clarifying issues with the property increases the value because um, it's like seeing buying some site unseen. You're taking a gamble. A lot of people don't want to take that gamble. But if you can actually see the property, like I'm using an analogy, but if you can see the property and understand it, it makes sense to you. And, and then you'll either want to invest or not. With the report, 
it explains everything in detail. Again, it's about 70 pages long and uh, um, it really takes the fear out of the purchase, I guess. So that's that's one example of a very simple, just the stage one report that we've done and mm -hmm. people use the flip properties all the time. Um, another one we did was uh, we did a distillery um, up in uh, um, Tien, Tiendaga, I guess near Kingston area anyways. I think it's Tien, Tien, Tien de Naga, yeah. Tien. I don't know how you pronounce it, Belleville-ish, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Belleville-ish, that's yeah. right. Uh, anyways, it, it was a great project. Basically, the gentleman owned a hunt camp, uh, um, a big piece of property, and uh, his father owned it anyways. And he wanted to put a distillery on the property because it was land he owned. He didn't have to buy land. And it was in an area that he, he could work with. Sure. Um, so distillery in a, in a uh, I guess it was a rural uh, area, uh, is unusual. Um, but we went through the process. We we established everything. I, um, because there was no services out there, it had to be on septic and, and water. And, that. and mm -hmm. because it's a distillery, there's a chance for for fire. Um, so we had to also do a 10,000 liter uh, holding tank. Um, so the fire department could tap into that to put a fire out if there was a fire, et cetera. Right. We had neighborhood concerns. There was a gentleman across the street who was opposed to alcohol. Um, I don't know why or what his story was, but anyways, he was opposed to just the, anything alcohol. So uh, we had that to deal with. Um, and and at the end of the day, we were successful. We got the approval. The, the gentleman uh, developed the distillery. I believe he's working on his first batch now. Um, really? So, so that's an interesting story. Anyways, it's successful. Uh, and in addition, we do wineries and all that as well um, throughout mm -hmm. Niagara, uh, Guelph, uh, Burlington and that as well. Could a neighbor, hang on. So the, the gentleman that was against alcohol, could a neighbor quash a planning application because they have some type of predisposition to the industry that's being started? So again, we could talk about this. We talk about what you call LPAD, which is now called uh, Terrell Trip Land Tribunal. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They changed the name again. Like, three oh times. my gosh. I didn't even know that. <laughs> when did but, they do this? But, but yes, yeah, so a neighbor... Well, a neighbor can stall a development, educated and logical in their approach. They can even kill a development. Mm -hmm. um, again, they, to do that, you typically have another planner working on the other side to, to frame the arguments. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, a neighbor, a sophisticated neighbor can cause a lot of problems with development, um, can stifle it, can delay it, can even kill it sometimes. So. Again, that's one of the things when you're doing the going through the process or you're you're planning on a development, you want to consider all the neighbors around it. So to minimize or mitigate what their issues will be, thereby reducing the likelihood of appeal. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Again, we can talk about it. <laughs> all right. I love it. Um, all right. So let's go down the path of some maybe one more success story and uh, we'll go from there. Sure. Um, so another thing that we, we've done is uh, we did this uh, back in 2016, I think. We, we've done a few since then, but uh, in Hamilton and Toronto and that. But we, laneway housing, that's a, a new interesting area that we uh, we get involved mm -hmm. with. Yeah. So um, as part of the, the provincial government, they uh, allow a secondary unit uh, as of right. Um, and the municipalities are catching up in terms of the zoning bylaw and official plans and that. Um, but laneway housing is a unique thing that's happening in Toronto. It's going to be happening in Hamilton. Actually, it hasn't happened in Hamilton, but they're 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 perfecting it in Hamilton. And other large municipalities are also looking at it. So it's a thing that's coming to help with infill, to help with housing issues, and et cetera. Um, and we looked at a, a property in Toronto. Uh, where was it? I think it written down here. Uh, Harvey Avenue in Toronto. And the gentleman had this he just picked it up at a, like a municipal auction years ago because it was just sitting there, but he couldn't do anything with it because it had no services, no, had a laneway access and they didn't permit that back then. Mm -hmm. um, but he was at the, at the verge of when Toronto was going to do it. Toronto had a pilot project back in 2016, 17 or something like that for the U of T area. Right. And then they expanded throughout the city. Anyways, point being is, is now with, with the intensification of the infill required because there's not enough housing out there and affordability as well. Municipalities are allowing laneways to be used as, as common streets, thereby allowing units to be built in a, with a laneway access only. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, you have to deal with servicing and, and things of that nature and contamination because laneways, often people dump stuff and that. But you can overcome these issues uh, to get value for a laneway lot. Um, and we're finding, too, that 
with laneways or even secondary units. Uh, so someone wants to put either a secondary unit within their building or perhaps a detached secondary unit, which some municipalities are allowing. Tiny houses are, are a really interesting way to approach that. So if you have a, a laneway housing, you could pop a tiny house in there. Uh, tiny house will run you maybe, I don't know, for I would say $100,000 um and then servicing connection another fifty thousand so one hundred fifty thousand for a uh, um, tiny home in a laneway now you're selling it for eight hundred thousand dollars something mm -hmm. uh the secondary units uh in your backyard uh for detached units you can easily pop a tiny home in there uh it's all taken care of you got your kitchen bathroom access uh, you know all that stuff in there and you don't have to worry about uh the dynamics of building another building in the back because you just pop it in now, when I talk about tiny homes, I'm not talking about ones that are on trailers. Uh, essentially, they'll have to be permanent structures. So basically, take it off the trailer and put it onto a foundation. But it's it's like a um, plug and play type idea mm -hmm. for for secondary units and housing. So we, anyways, the, the gentleman in the laneway housing that we dealt with, he had a property you couldn't do anything with at that time. And we explained and, and, and uh, went through and then he could develop a unit on that. So this property that he... You know, I, he bought very cheaply uh, at an auction that you couldn't do anything with. All of a sudden, it's worth like a million dollars. Um, that wow. was a, a big success, right? Um, at an auction, he bought it at an auction, a municipal auction, yeah, for like wow. bankruptcies or whatever, non-tax yep. uh, sales. Um, and and to explain that though, that there are there are a number of oh, there's no there's no good development land left out there. Essentially, the good stuff has been bought up by by the big boys, the big developers out there. The green the low, low hanging fruit, if you will. <laughs> yeah, that, that's all gone. I mean, that was gone ten years ago or so. Hmm. So now we need to look at and and for my clients, so small, medium sized developers, mom and pops, the the opportunities out there are are numerous. If you're looking, uh, look for lots that that are uh, large lots with a single house on it. Um, so you could sever it to make two or three or four lot, uh, lots or dwellings on it. We have secondary units that can be put in houses now. Um, you know, but you have to appreciate that any new development that you want to do is going to have issues such as natural heritage issues, uh, uh, traffic issues, neighborhood issues, political issues. Um, there's going to be a lot of minutia that you have to go through to get it. But at the end of the day, they are attainable. Um, you just have to to understand that and factor those surprises or factor those issues into your budget. And again, when we do a review, a lot of those issues will be identified so you can help you factor your in. Um, most of our clients, a lot of people, a lot of developers I know have lost their shirts because they, they got hit with a new, uh, maybe an archaeological or maybe there was a noise study they had to do and they, you mm -hmm. know, these weren't factored into their budgets and they end up breaking even, which no one wants to do that. Why are you in business? Sure. Um, so through our identification, we can identify those things so you can factor them into your budgets and say, is this a good project for me or not before you get too far down the road? Hmm. Noise study. Oh, I've been there. <laughs> so, so, so I was doing this. It was, a, it was a, like a simple building. It was a triplex and we split the land, whatever. And they're like, yeah, you got to do this noise study because you're on a major arterial road. I'm like, oh, okay, pretty standard. Well, gosh, by the time we got done this thing, it was like, thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. I'm like, clearly, because you have to register it on title, right? And I was like, clearly, if somebody ever buys this project down the road, it's on a major, inter like it's it's rated an intersection, they're going to know that there's traffic. I, I, I just thought this was ridiculous, but apparently you have to you have to disclose these things that it is busy and that cars drive on this route. And because cars drive there, it's loud. Like, I, I don't know, it, it blew me away. I just couldn't believe that it was at, <laughs> that's silly well the, the uh, again one of the, the things i got disenchanted with with the municipal side is things like that um there has to be some common knowledge uh you know why do we have to put so much red tape and everything in front of this when again if i'm buying a property next to a highway yeah it's going to be noisy you know, yeah. you know i had a we had a uh, when i was working for the uh, uh the city of, of guelph we had we had a uh, an existing industrial use that's been there you know, 60, 70 years, and we had residential that was beside it that was maybe 20 years old. And we now got endless complaints from the residents saying it's too noisy. It's too, it's, you know, you're living next to an industrial building that's been there forever. They have forklifts. They have, they still operate as an industrial use. You chose to live beside it. Not only that, there's probably a discount on your price because you're right beside it. 
right now you feel that you have the, the privilege or whatever to complain about that business um it's just it's it's crazy what goes on there now people just feel i don't know if it's social media or whatever but people feel they have the right to complain about any nuisance uh, or, or or silliness out there hmm. and that's Let's get into neighborhood appeals and that because they just feel that their voice should be heard sure sure i mean i did another development one time and the neighbors came out and they uh, they talked about the school bus they're like oh the school bus goes on this road you can't build here and i was like well everybody uses this road that's what it's for and then it was put through <laughs> like no issues <laughs> it, was, it was silly but that was one of the complaints and a lot of people come into these things uneducated right we and had, i just uh, just to, on that note we had yeah. one just just recently in um uh, uh where was it it was uh uh, anyways, it was down in Niagara. I can't remember the municipality, but they were, we were putting a, a uh, subdivision in, and the biggest complaint was school buses go down our road and they're going to impact traffic, and they're yeah. going to impact parking, etc. Nothing to do with our development. It's just school buses, and the funny thing was the the road had no traffic on it, had no parking on it. Like you could park anywhere because there's no parking spaces taken up, but the perception of the of the neighbors was. It's too much, and and compared to Toronto, it's nothing. But compared to their municipality, you know, an extra five cars is too much for them. And, and it's so it's right. a perspective that they have, which which leads to sometimes the issues in the at hand. Sure. Okay. So on that note, let's talk about some of the technical side of of land planning. So we talked about uh, what I call the LPAT. Now it's got a new name. Let's let's start there. When things go not so great, we end up in land court. Tell us about that. Yeah, so any project should anticipate uh, an appeal uh, or having to go through through a Ontario Land Tribunal, it's called now. Um, uh, you can never foresee what's going to happen, but you should always budget for it and, and allow time for it. Uh, if it doesn't happen, great. It's a bonus. You save that money. You save that time. But you don't want to be caught off guard and, and find out that that your your all your profits going to be sucked up with a with an appeal because you didn't anticipate it. What's like uh, what's a, what's a hearing cost? Like let let's just say on a small project like an infill lot versus um, a, a land assembly or a farm. What does a small appeal cost? What does a big appeal cost? So, so the costs are different. Uh, uh, the magnitude of issues, obviously, and the the, the yeah. length of the hearing as well. Most okay, hearings range, are maybe. most hearings are one day, maybe two days. Okay. Um, and and uh, before a planner could bring you to a, a, an OMB, whatever, and argue it and, and all that stuff, and you just hire a planner. The Law Society of Upper Canada uh, took exception to that because I guess some of the lawyers weren't getting hired. Uh, so they got legislation passed where, and, and I guess rightfully so, so it's not, I'm not uh, uh, dismissing them, but a planner provides expert testimony. In providing expert testimony, we can't be biased to our client's concerns. So in that perspective, you have to hire a lawyer to, to, to argue your personal or financial concerns, and you bring a planner in to give expert planning testimony to support those arguments. Um, now, obviously, you want to hire a planner that agrees with your position or your lawyer's position, uh, because as, as a lawyer can argue whatever way they want, right, left, center, morally, mm -hmm. ethically, whatever. A planner has to agree with the position that they're putting forward as an expert uh, um, uh, expert witness. If I don't agree, but I'm testifying towards something, I can I lose my license. I can lose my accreditation because really, uh, I have to. I have to heartfully agree with what I'm suggesting is good planning. Yeah. Um, so there's a code of ethics that are different for a planner versus <laughs> that of a lawyer. That's very interesting Absolutely. because of your designation. Yeah. The, uh, yes. Uh, uh, lawyers are a different animal. <laughs> so anyways, you have to hire a lawyer, you have to hire a planner typically to be successful on an appeal. A lawyer is going to cost you, I mean, I'm guessing based on experience, uh, a lawyer could cost you uh, anywhere from ten to $30,000, uh, depends on what the issues are. A planner is going to cost you a neighborhood of ten to $15,000, say. So uh, time, and that, that's just the two. If you have to hire another, say there's a, someone's arguing uh, traffic, you're going to have to bring a traffic expert in to, mm -hmm. to argue that. And the thing that people don't understand is, and the reason developers typically, I would say win, the, the, the uh, perception is developers win at the board. Mm -hmm. And it's not that the board will call the board, it's called the tribunal now, but 
it's not that the tribunal is pro-development per se. It's just developers have the means and, and expertise to properly argue a, a position where, where neighbors don't. Um, so if you have, uh, if, if a neighbor raises a traffic issue, you can go to the board, I can go as a planner and just say, you know, from a planning point of view, there's not an issue here, but that equals each other out in terms of, of issues. But if I, if you bring a, an expert, uh, so a, a traffic engineer and the traffic engineer testifies, that traffic engineer trumps a neighbor who just has non-educated concerns. So, so when you bring an expert and the other person doesn't have an expert, that expert typically trumps uh, their opinion. Now, if the neighborhood, I've worked on neighborhood committees before where, where a bunch of neighbors have gathered together and pooled their money to hire someone like me or other people. If they can bring an expert to it, so they have an expert and you have an expert, then it's up to the, the tribunals really to decide who is the proper expert, who gives the best opinion. Um, what you have to do at a hearing is, is the best you can do is provide the most compelling argument uh, from a planning point of view, because it's a planning tribunal, um, as to what should occur, what the decision should be. Uh, we had a case uh, in Toronto, T-Lab, which is Toronto local appeal body, which is the same as oh, the tri Atlanta Tribunal, but it's Toronto because the, the provincial government separated it because Toronto's so, so huge. Right. Uh, this is recent? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we had a hearing where, well, I've been to the board, Tribunal, T-Lab, numerous, numerous times, right? Uh, really? Mm -hmm. And I argue things the same way, typically all the time. Uh, um, you know, different spins on it, depends on... on what we're what we're doing um and what my opinions are um but anyways i argued something in a certain way or gave testimony a certain way and it was, it was a new board member and they just said i don't like your argument you didn't give enough information i've used this argument like numerous times but it was just you never know what the board member or the tribunal member is going to want so mm -hmm. so you just have to give the most uh the most information the most compelling argument you can offer and then put it in the, the board member tribunal members hands um and that means that if you bring uh professionals that will support your position um essentially any any opposition that you get from either well, from the neighbors uh whether it's traffic or whether it's uh height or shadows or whatever you should have an expert to counter that position that can trump their position the one thing i will say too is if you do not ever really want to have opposition from city staff. You want to do whatever is necessary to get city staff on your side. Not that it has to be that way, but it makes life so much easier because if you go to an appeal and the neighborhood neighbor appeals, you say, and they have the city also pee, now you have a professional planner with your professional planner arguing. And the view is like, like police officer, if they arrest you, it's assumed that the police officer is correct because they arrested you. They may be totally out to lunch, but you have to prove your innocence, essentially, right? Even though you're innocent until proven guilty, the officer is assumed to have arrested you correctly. When you go to an appeal, it's assumed that the city is acting in the public's best interest and that the, the developer is the evil developer and, and they have to prove over the city that they're correct. If you go into an appeal with the city on board, now you got two professional planners moving forward. So... It's very important to make sure that you do whatever is necessary to get the city on board because you don't want to have to argue on two different fronts. Yeah, it would be cheaper to make a few concessions on the front end than take it through the tribunal and have issues. Absolutely. Yep. Interesting. Okay, and faster too. <laughs> Way faster. And the carrying process is, is usually never discussed. I mean, we can talk about delays. We can talk about process. I mean, every time you're looking at a new report, you're at least four weeks or so, maybe maybe right. longer. It depends on the season and how busy everybody is. Um, right. You're still paying taxes on the property. You're still paying mortgage fees on the property. You're still paying whatever. The, the carrying costs can eat away at your profit margin over a two-year period. Mm -hmm. I always tell my clients, I say, from the point of inception in your head to, of a development to shovel in the ground is typically three years. So you have to factor three years of carrying costs before you're actually going to make any money off this thing. Yeah. And that's for something larger or something smaller or both? Like an addition or something like that. That's That shouldn't mm -hmm. take that long. But from, right. from a, a new development, so a, a raw piece of land, vacant land, say, or de demolition of something on a piece of land, mm -hmm. from start of the idea when you buy the land to actual shovel in the ground, give yourself, well, give yourself two to three years. And I, I always say three years because, again, if it goes two years, bonus. You, you, you haven't anticipated that. You have a little bit extra profit because you didn't anticipate it. Yeah. I heard, uh, I have a friend that, that does condo development and he was saying you're seven years end to end from raw land 
fresh idea to, okay, here's the condo certificate to the buyer, seven years. It, it depends on the scale of the condo. And we have done industrial condos that are, that are four years or so. We've done larger apartment condos that, that again, are seven years or so. And yeah. a lot of it, the development- That's residential, high rise. Yeah, so a the, the, lot of the, the development, the building itself is the easy part. Well, not the easy part, but it's, it's very cut and dry in terms of what we have to do to get there. And that, again, three, four years or so. But going through the legal and the, setting up the condominium and setting up the board and all that stuff takes time too. So that adds to it. It's interesting you say that because I always felt the same way. I said the land planning is kind of where you make the money and the construction after that is just a formality. That's sort of how that's sort of like it, it sounds crazy because construction has so many moving parts and pieces to it. But in in a way, it's it's kind of true, like your bricks and sticks and so on. But like the dirt is really where the value is driven from. Well, there's 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 three three scenarios. The the one is the developer and the developer will call the, the land developer, mm -hmm. they take it from raw land to useful land so that it could be, for argument's sake, agricultural land or or industrial land or whatever. And they do that process to convert it to residential land or institution or whatever, right? They change the use to allow for a higher use, higher density, higher function. So there's value there. Um, a lot of times our clients take that, do that, and then flip the property to someone who's going to be building it. Uh, sometimes they build it themselves. So the next step is the building. There's profit to be made from the raw land that's approved to the actual finished product of the building that's finished. Um, so there's profit there. And then finally, there's there's profit from resale. So the the price point of a, of a new building is typically low, especially in the first building of a development. Once it's occupied and people are established there and the amenities such as parklands, trees, are they start to grow in, that value typically in our market anyways, in Ontario's market goes up. So then you have the resale value from, from initial construction, pre-sale, mm -hmm. occupied. Now you're reselling the occupied units and so there's profit there. Uh, each one you know, has its own benefits and, and uh, pitfalls and, and trials and errors, um, but each stage there's money to be made. For sure. Yeah, from the investor perspective, I mean, the whole project has to be worth more than the sum of its parts. Right. That is the inherent profit. Like that's that's the name of the game. Yeah. You know? So okay, cool. Um, on the technical side of things, MZO. I think I called you about this one like a year ago. I, I heard about this thing called an MZO. I didn't know what it was. You explained it to me. Can you re-explain it for the listeners? Minister Zoning Order. So it's not. It hasn't really been used that much. They they changed the policies um, that if essentially if you're going through a planning. Pro okay, there's a background here. Mm -hmm. So so municipalities and the provincial government don't always see eye to eye on things. The provincial government, and they we're talking in theory, not in practicality, right? But in theory, the provincial government is looking at what's best for the province, how to solve provincial scale issues. Um, the municipalities are children of the province. So the municipalities only exist by the permission of the provincial government through the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Um, sometimes municipalities lose that sight and feel that they are the most important because they deal directly with constituents and voters and stuff like that. And they are on the ground in terms of their policies versus the theoretical provincial policies. So the province comes in and, and each time we have a liberal, conservative, NDP, whatever government come in, they have their own view on how the province should act and, and respond to issues. Um, the liberal government uh, uh, previously was... Um, well, I don't get into politics, but anyways, the the, the new <laughs> government, the conservatives that are in, had a different view than the liberals, and they wanted to make sure that we address housing uh, issues, affordability, transportation, things of that nature, which is a different position than what the previous liberals had. Um, they passed uh, or enforced uh, secondary units in houses. Um, not that that wasn't done earlier, but they more solidified in this government. Mm -hmm. uh, they looked at different transportations. They looked at they looked at uh, infill uh, development and housing issues, and they passed laws that allow secondary units as a right. They passed laws that have intensification targets through through the um, um, sorry the policies is the uh, the growth plan for Ontario. Um, yeah. This is what each municipality should accommodate as they grow. And large municipalities, obviously, more people would go there. Their numbers were bigger. They had to accommodate. Um, they looked at natural heritage. We just can't be bulldozing. Uh, farms to make houses. You can't take out rivers and streams to make houses. You have to be uh, sensitive to those type of uses and build within the framework. Mm -hmm. And we have we have something called the green belt, um, which you can't build within. Essentially, I mean, uh, um, 
there's exceptions, but uh, the Oak Ridge Marine, the Greenbelt, the Niagara Escarpment, um, and there's urban areas that we've identified that should take the growth. So the provincial government has passed these policies to say this is where growth should occur. The municipalities, they are, they're stuck in the middle where as a neighbor, say as a landowner, I own a home. I argue that I don't want you to go to the farmer's fields anymore and build greenfield housing. So the only alternative is to infill, right. uh, to create new densities within the existing urban fabric. And there's a lot of benefits to that because you're using this, the, the services that are in the street, mm -hmm. they're typically, you know, it could be at 40%, 50%, 60% capacity, but you do in the development, now they're at 65, 70% capacity. So you're, there's inherent value in those pipes that are already there that you're gonna utilize. Uh, there's electrical wires. There's there's transportation corridors already established. There's all this stuff that's already there. You're just mm -hmm. adding more density. The problem is, as a as a landowner, and I'm not speaking to myself because I'm I understand the process, but <laughs> I'd say 98% of landowners or house owners out there, when you go to propose an apartment building or a fourplex right beside them, they lose their minds. Like, how dare you? I I lived in this neighborhood for 40 years. This is our neighborhood. You can't come in and change like that. It's going to change the dynamic. There's going to be poor people living here because they have apartments. There's going to be, uh, we've, we've established these lot sizes, the mature trees, like whatever argument you have. Mm -hmm. yeah. But they go to their politicians, the city politicians, and they say, I'm not voting for you if you're going to allow this development to happen next to me. And it's not identified in a specific neighborhood. It happens throughout the city. And people see down, it's not even affecting them, but two blocks away, there's an apartment building. They're like, you can't have that because it's going to come to me next. Right, right. So you have municipal politicians that are trying to, their whole job, because the full-time politicians, their whole job is to get reelected. That's their job. So they're not going to do something that's going to get them fired or get them not reelected. So they're typically going to side with what gives them employment. Um, and I'm speaking generally, I'm not speaking to any specific politician, right? Because mm -hmm. politicians will take exception to what I'm saying, I'm sure. <laughs> but <laughs> it's a full-time job. You want to have a full-time job because if you get don't get elected, you got to find a different job. Right. Follow the money, right? That's it. Bottom line. Right. Yeah. So now we have the municipal politicians saying, I'm not going to approve infill development because my constituents won't vote me in if I do. And you have the provincial government saying, you have to allow infill development to occur. So ex example is City of Hamilton. Um, they had provincial numbers that they had to accommodate for, for employment and housing. Mm -hmm. And the only way they could accommodate that essentially is to either intensify greatly or to expand the urban boundary of the city to allow some greenfield development to occur, to, to allow more land to, to have new development. Um, so the citizen said, no way, there's no way you're going to have apartments next door to me. I mean, I'm going to oppose you. My neighborhood is pristine. Like if you look at Ancaster um, or even Dundas, more Ancaster, the, the neighborhoods are crazy up there that they 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 don't want change. And it's, it's evident through many, many appeals and that that has gone through that area. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, so so ha city of Hamilton refused to allow the urban expansion. But they also aren't approving infill development. So we're stifled here as to development that's going to happen in Hamilton. I mean, there are projects going on in Hamilton, yeah. but not to the level or scale that needs to occur to reflect the provincial designated numbers that they need to accommodate. So they won't expand the boundary, but they also don't want intensification, which means you sit tight. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, okay. that. so I expect what will happen, though, is, I mean, we have to allow development to occur. I mean, the house prices are going up. There's interest rate issues. There's 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 uh, immigration uh, issues. There's there's a lot of different factors why housing prices are going up. Um, but when we don't have new development and there's a there's a supply versus demand, the demand is greater than supply. Houses prices are going to go up. So we have to create more supply. Um, anyway, so the the problem is we have a municipality, not Hamilton, but element generally all municipalities are are facing the same problem. They don't want to allow infill all over the place because they have yeah. issues. The provincial government is like, we got to have infill to allow this. So there's a municipal election coming up this October and and uh, local politicians will be reelected or new ones will be elected, whatever. And that's fine. Things generally won't change though because full-time politicians need to satisfy their constituents. Mm -hmm. And the province is faced with the problem that they're still facing the same problem that municipalities aren't going to 
typically uh, include these numbers that they need to provide. So I think what's going to happen, and the provincial government is strategic, that they probably won't act until after the election. But municipalities who are not allowing appropriate infill development or stifling infill development for whatever reason, the provincial government is going to do, going to force their hand, whether it's through a ministry zoning order, whether it's through whether it's through um, new provincial policies that force their hand, but essentially uh, the provincial government is going to force their children or the municipalities to act in a certain manner. Mm -hmm. uh, again, we don't know how that will occur. And it's my speculation that the provincial government will do this after the election because they don't want to do it before and become a political right. issue. Um, but something has to be done. And a minister's zoning order in that is where the ministry does not agree with the process or the decision or the obstacles that are being faced by a development. And they come in and they say, no, from a provincial interest point of view, this is this is the way it needs to be. And they, they can override a municipality. It really has to go right up the flagpole. You, you said provincial interest, so like a hospital, like a highway, or could you do an MZO on something small? Like I want to put up a convenience store in this corner and the town's giving me a hard time. It, it it's, it's the smaller the scale of development, the, the less likely you're going to get a minister of zoning order, unless something is like completely out to lunch, like your, your zone for, I don't, I mean, I don't want to give an example, but mm -hmm. you can essentially have your use, but someone stifles you. I mean, yeah. It's usually larger scale developments, and and people when it first came through, they're like, "Oh, just get a ministry zone order." No, you you can't. You have to go through the child, the, the, the protocol, right? You have to go through the child before you go through the parent. If you go right to the parent. The answer is typically going to be no because you gotcha. have to. There's a process to go through. You have to you have to uh, go through all the measures and all the processes and steps in a, in the protocol, so so you can. Uh, get the parent or the, the province to override what's been done. And it, it's not a common thing. Plan of subdivision, minor variance, and rezoning applications. What do all three of these mean and how do they work together harmoniously with each other? So, um, and again, in my seminar, I kind of explain all this stuff that's on our website under the, mm -hmm. the shop one. Um, but essentially you have different levels of policy and the official plan is a guiding policy. The zoning bylaw is the implementing policy and and your development has to be in line with all the policies from the from the top down so you can have a regional official plan you can have a local official plan you can have a zoning bylaw you have a secondary plan i mean there's a lot of different policies in play here mm -hmm. um but essentially oh well, they didn't cut the cable out there they did the, uh, there's people outside doing excavation on the road. See the guy holding the cable on the street uh, in his hand. Great. All right, thanks for watching the Highest and Best Use podcast. As you guys can tell, we got cut off. The internet got cut. That's one of the things that happens when you're doing digital online platform stuff. Uh, obviously, the podcast was fantastic, and Terrence was a great guest, but we'll have to have him back. Please keep an eye out for episode two. In the meantime, don't forget to check out thehighestandbestuse.com for the book and anything else that we post. I'm Ryan Carr. Hope you're having a great day.